whenever we were on our studies in the intertestamental period, we were looking at the Sadducees, and I gave you five statements about them. We partially dealt with the last of those, number five, and we're going to complete that tonight. And that was this statement, that the Pharisees, or the Sadducees rather, rejected what they felt were theological innovations which had been introduced by the Pharisees. They rejected some of the doctrinal teachings of the more numerous and popular party known as the Pharisees because they felt they were innovative. And we looked at these uh, examples in order, the Pharisaic expectation of the coming of the Messiah, at predestination, and at the existence of spirit beings. The Pharisees believed in spirits, good and bad, demons and angels, and the Sadducees deny that. They deny predestination. They are more the Arminians of their day. They put a lot of faith and uh, have a lot of regard for human responsibility, and they denied uh, messianic expectation. And that took us back to the Maccabee period where they felt that had been realized already. So we're not going to go over that ground again. We're going to come tonight to the other two areas that I want to deal with, and we'll conclude on this note also our study of the Sadducees, and that is the Sadducean denial of bodily resurrection and their rejection of a full canon of Scripture. And we'll look at them in that order. So we'll start with the doctrine of the resurrection. You remember the little joke I gave you last time. This is what people say oftentimes. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They were sad, you see. So that really brings us to something that the Sadducees are perhaps best known for, maybe even better known for this than their rejection of a spirit world. The Pharisees had a very uh, real and vivid spirit world with all different types of spirits, good and bad. And the scriptures teach that good spirits and evil spirits. But the Sadducees denied that, and they also deny resurrection. Now let's uh, go back to the Pharisaic belief on this for a moment, because that's been a few weeks ago to remind ourselves. The Pharisees did believe in the resurrection. Uh, their belief was uh, perhaps not always as clear or always as biblical as we would hope. Uh, they had a belief in the resurrection of the body that sometimes, at least with some of the less orthodox among the Pharisees, bordered on a reincarnation. They felt that um, people would come back and exist in a body, and it would be after death, uh, but it wouldn't always be according to Old Testament or New Testament doctrine on the resurrection of the body. They'd come back and exist. There was bodily existence after death, but it wasn't always your own body. You could come back as a soul and inhabit the body of someone else. Now, that, I don't think, was the predominant uh, belief among the Pharisees. That was maybe held by some fringe members of that uh, fraternal commune known as the Pharisaic Brotherhood. When we come to the Sadducees, however, we don't have to um, quibble over whether or not they had a clear or biblical doctrine on the resurrection or not. They rejected any doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. Now, two scriptures are of particular importance here. Acts 23, we're going to begin here tonight, verses 1 through 10. Acts 23, verses 1 through 10. There are two particular ones. Well, the second of these has double parallels in the synoptic gospels. All three of the synoptics, in other words, cover that. And there are some lesser, smaller scriptures that we're not going to spend time on, but we'll start tonight in Acts chapter 23. The Pharisees don't have the clearest doctrine, at least all of them, on the resurrection. The Sadducees don't have any doctrine on the resurrection, except such doesn't exist. We know this from other writings outside of the canon of the New Testament, but we know it from the New Testament as well. Now, we used Acts 23 uh, last time in looking at the Sadducean denial of the spirit world. There are no spirits. You either live in a body as a human being or as an animal or you're a tree or a flower or a rock or a sun. They exist. Spirits, no. That would be miraculous. And the Sadducees were the secularists of their day, the anti-supernaturalists. They denied the existence or the possibility of any of these things. So we've used Acts 23 uh, once for that before. The end of verse 8, the Sadducees deny angel or spirit. 
They deny angel or spirit. The Pharisees, in the end of verse 9, they agree in spirit and angel. Whether a spirit or angel has spoken by Paul, they don't know, but perhaps he has, so it's best to accept what Paul is saying because he might have a revelation in that area, which is really interesting. The conservatives of our day uh, who find themselves as the modern-day counterpart to the Pharisees of the first century would never go that far. It has to be in Scripture. An angel or a spirit speaking by you, they would not accept any new revelation. But we need to read this passage to get it in context and get what the discussion is all about. It isn't really about the spirit world, angels or demons. That comes up as a secondary issue, and it's related. But that's really not what the heart of the matter is. Uh, back two chapters earlier, Paul has uh, come to Jerusalem. Uh, back in the in chapter 21, halfway through it, Paul's come to Jerusalem. He, some of his actions in Jerusalem are misinterpreted by some of the local Jews there. They saw him with a Gentile who was not allowed to go beyond a certain boundary wall in the temple precincts. They assumed that Paul had taken this Gentile beyond that when, in fact, he hadn't. But sometimes an assumption is all that it takes to start a riot, which they do. Chapter 22 is a little interruption where Paul is uh, doing some witnessing to some of the Romans who have chained him up. He's in the fortress of Antonia, and he is awaiting the opportunity to present his case before the Jewish Sanhedrin. That's what chapter 23, or at least the first half, is all about. He's awaiting the opportunity to present his case before the highest tribunal among the Jewish people. So this is what verse 1 opens with. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, the council of the 70, plus their leader, the Sanhedrin, said, men and brethren, the and is italicized. He didn't talk to two groups, it's one group. Men, brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Well, he didn't get any past an introductory remark. The high priest, we see, I guess, just thought the audacity to make such a statement. <laughs> And you get in trouble today if you make any positive statement about yourself, like you're lacking in, you know, humility or something. Paul wasn't lacking in humility, but at the same time, he wasn't lacking in honesty. You know, sometimes you can be so humble, and it's a false humility, that you deny truth. And that's dishonesty then. We've had our problems with that. Everyone has had their problems with that. Paul simply says, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Of course, it's up to us to either say we believe him or we don't, which would be to say I think he's telling the truth or he's lying. The leader of the Sanhedrin felt that he was lying. Verse 2, the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Now let's remind ourselves that Ananias being the high priest would also be of this party we're discussing now, the Sadducees. Yeah. The high priest had to belong to the a priestly ruling party, as it were, and that is the Sadducean party. The Pharisees make up at least part of the Sanhedrin, but the ones who have the uh, governmental control, as it were, the Sadducees, sometimes in principle and practice, uh, they differ. In principle, the Sadducees have their own interpretations. In practice, they follow the interpretations of the Pharisee, but in government, they are in control. So he starts off his address, and he's interrupted by Ananias, who is a Sadducee, and he commands Paul to be slapped across the face. And Paul said unto him in verse uh, 3, if you've ever read the adventures of Tom Sawyer, I don't know why this verse reminds me, but it may, may remind you of that. You remember old Tom Sawyer and his aunt, she had him out whitewashing that fence to keep him busy. Well, he, Paul says to him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. You know, back in the olden days, that's what they did. You know, a whited wall just means something that you're not trying to upkeep, but you're trying to fool people into thinking that you're upkeeping it. So you throw a coat of paint on it. You just, you know, whiten it up. And it's really not clean underneath, or it's really not proper underneath. So Paul is, that's what Paul is saying to this man. You hold an important position. You appear to be, you know, the top religious figure in Israel. Wall would be that part. But you're so filled with unbelief and hypocrisy and deceit and anti-God notions, you're a whited wall. And that whited business is covered up 
in your true nature. And he goes on to explain essentially what I've said. For sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? You know, a classy example of the sayers who are not doers. You're sitting to judge me after the law. You know, Old Testament had set into motion uh, certain Jewish tribunals. Moses had his 70 men under him, and they would hear cases and judge and make decisions. And so you're sitting judging me after the law, and you command me to be smitten contrary to the law. You know, they don't have any evidence against Paul. Nothing has been proven against him. You can't just go out striking and beating people. And so in verse 4, uh, he's interrupted again. They that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? You've got Paul speaking, then he's being smitten by Ananias, the high priest, and now a third group of people, a third party voice is heard, the people around, probably other members of the Sanhedrin. Revilest thou God's high priest? You know, to call him a whited wall. We today, I had to use the illustration I gave, because we today wouldn't catch what it means to call someone a whited wall. We just wouldn't get much out of that. What does that mean? I would never be offended by that. If you really knew what you were being called, it's being called an old hypocrite, an old lying dog is what you're calling the person. Whited wall sounds appropriate maybe today. Maybe it sounds like, you know, an elevated term for something that is much lower, but it was a low term for something that was equally low then, a whited wall. Remember, Jesus talked about whitewashing the graves, the tombs, back in Matthew 23. Same idea, same business, a lot of hypocrisy involved. And that's the chapter on hypocrites, remember. Verse 5 can be interpreted a variety of different ways. Then said Paul, I wist, wist means in KJV language, knew. I knew not, brethren, that he was the high priest. Well, what are we to, to gather from that? Well, I don't know that the text is really certain though the text will leave us, rather, with a certain interpretation. There are a lot of different ways to interpret that. Uh, they've asked Paul, don't you know who you're addressing? How can you be addressing God's high priest? He's God's authority. How can you be addressing him um, in such derogatory terms and with such uh, pejorative words? Paul said, I didn't know that he was God's high priest. Well, uh, doesn't Paul know? I mean, the... the hierarchy, what goes on in the Jewish religious structure? Well, one argument is that Paul's been away from uh, Jerusalem perhaps for several years at this time, and he simply isn't knowledgeable who the current high priest is. So he says in all truthfulness here, I didn't know, brethren, that he was the high priest. But then a counter argument to that would be, well, it doesn't matter whether or not Paul had been there for the last few years you would know as you are being uh, called together with all these other people and it's in a formal setting and you can count them in one two three se 71 of them it's a sanhedrin and the one around whom all the others are the one on the throne with the robes and the garments on and holding the golden scepter as it were that's the leader he's the high priest so you would know who it is so that argument some people uh, think kind of overrules the a thought that Paul actually didn't know. Another one of the things that could be said, maybe this is the easiest explanation here, since Paul is already using some rather striking and biting language uh, in verse 3. Paul's no pushover here, even before a Jewish Sanhedrin, Paul's no pushover here. Amen. That in uh, verse 5, Paul means this in irony. Oh, I didn't know. Excuse me. <laughs> Because see, he just said in the end of verse 3, why do you sit to judge me after the law and command me to be smitten contrary to the law? In other words, his irony would be, you're acting in such a way I never would have guessed who you were. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be the underlying irony of Paul's <laughs> statement here. You're acting in such a way I never would have guessed in a million years that you were a Jewish high priest. I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest. There are many ways. There are other ways. We're not in Acts right now, so we don't want to get into all the various interpretations. I like this one because it kind of accords with Paul's statement in the end of verse 3 there. Because Paul is saying very clearly here that you're a sayer, you're a sayer and a no-doer. You say, but you don't do. You have all the outward forms. You're sitting 
to judge me according to the law, but you command me to be smitten contrary to the law. You're a sayer, but you don't do. Remember, Jesus said, not concerning this religious group, but another one, the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 2, they sit in Moses' seat, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. Matthew 23, 2 and 3. Sadducees, any religious group except a true one, will find themselves in the same place as sayers and no doers. They don't do. So perhaps this is the way that we're to take it. It's a, a moot question, I suppose, tonight, since we're not on that verse in particular. But Paul said, I knew not, brethren, that he was a high priest. Maybe that's said in irony. Paul does go on to say, for it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. So Paul recognizes that there is, and he quotes Old Testament, a Pentateuchal law here, that there's Old Testament precedent, there's Old Testament teaching concerning the attitude one should have for those in authority over you. Uh, but then again, it could be argued whether or not this um, religious leader really has any authority over the apostle Paul. He's a Jewish high priest of an apostate, Christ-rejecting nation and system. And Paul is the, is the Lord Jesus Christ's own anointed apostle. Amen. So you could get into trouble saying that really Paul's in trouble for, you could get into trouble for saying Paul's in trouble resisting authority. If anyone's an authority in the situation, the apostle Paul is the one in the authority. Maybe by quoting the verse, though, he simply, another um, point of irony here showing them that in fact if anyone in this whole group of 72 people at least if anyone knows the Old Testament It's him Amen. He can quote from it Hallelujah. If anyone knows the Bible, it's him. It's the one on charge for his life If anyone knows the Old Testament, it's not the Jews there It's this Christian man who for all practical purposes. They would count as a Gentile or a heathen Paul wasn't. He goes on to say that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Jew of Jews, a legalist of them all. But they would count him as a dog, a heathen, a Gentile. But if anyone knows the Bible, he knows. And he quotes it rather well from uh, the book of Exodus. So that's our little foray into some of the problems surrounding the first five verses. Let's go on. It gets easier as far as interpretation goes. Those are a little bit difficult to know. Is Paul resisting authority? And on and on and on. But when Paul perceived, now th this has all taken place and we look at some of those solutions, proposed ones in verse 5, and now Paul kind of steps back and regroups, takes stock of the situation, and starts all over again. <laughs> he comes up with this new policy of divide and conquer. I mean, he was, I don't know where he was headed to begin with. See, we'll never know that. We'll never know the end of that sermon. He was headed somewhere, and it's not where he ends up, though. He, he, wasn't, he would never have used this um, divide the Pharisees and the Sadducees type of approach if he hadn't been stopped. I don't know what he would have said. He starts off, men, brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. I don't know where he would have headed in that sermon, but we'll have to talk to him in the next slide to find out. Because he steps back, takes stock, regroups, settles on a new policy instead of uh, self-flattery here, divide and conquer. When Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, well, you don't want to make too much of that term perceived. Paul, perhaps himself earlier in life as Saul, the Jewish man, had been a part of the Sanhedrin. He knew the three groups that made it up. He knew it was made up of Sadducees and Pharisees. So we don't want to make too much of the term perceived. It's just that Paul takes note of that in a very mental way and decides to do something about the knowledge that he has. Now I'm going to do something. I'm going to act on the basis of, Luke has to tell us what Paul is thinking. There are two groups here, at least, Sadducees and Pharisees, who are mutual opponents. And so he takes stock of the situation and he decides on this new course, and the new course is to side with the Pharisees. <laughs> uh, he believes in the resurrection. And as we'll see, this throws a wrench into the whole discussion, especially as far as the... Uh, Sadducees are concerned but what you find interesting in the middle of verse 6 is that I don't think Paul is really shaken taken aback called off guard it only takes him a moment of reflection to regroup look the situation over quickly he doesn't have all day to do this and decide what to say next 
And then notice he used the exact same words and simply starts his message over again. Men, brethren. Men and brethren began his sermon in verse 1. His second sermon, or the regrouping of his first one, is found to start in the same way, the middle of verse 6. He simply starts over again. He's not intimidated by these religious kooks here. You know, they, they think that's what he is. He goes on to say, I think it's in the next chapter, that it's after the way they call heresy. Amen. So worship I the God of my fathers. Believing all things that are written in the law and the prophets. After the way they call it. But the kooks in the group are not Paul. It's all these other Jewish religiously minded people. So he's not intimidated. He's not caught unaware, thrown off track, taken aback or anything. He just starts over. Men, brethren. First sentence was, I have lived. Second one, I am a Pharisee. This is just, you can learn so much from Scripture. It's brilliant strategy as far as the Apostle Paul. I don't know what you could do. You could get into all types of problems and defend yourself and argue and count, and you would never get anywhere. So he decides to throw what I said earlier was a wrench into the whole affair. You know what happens when you throw a wrench into a machine or something? He throws a wrench into it. And he is, can, well, of course, he's carried away in the end, but... As it were, he walks away from the whole thing and leaves the two dogs fighting among themselves. He's free from it. There's a lot of irony in this passage. Luke is showing the stupidity of the two groups here and the brilliance that comes from Christ. He's made unto us wisdom, remember, 1 Corinthians 1.30. The wisdom or the brilliance of the apostle Paul. So he says, I'm a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees, and of the hope and resurrection of the dead I am called in question. Oh, a challenging cry like old Patrick Henry here. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I'm called in question. That's the end of he, That's all he has to say. That is his sermon. I don't know where he was going after verse 1. It probably would have been a rather long one. Like Stephen's, you know, that was a long defense. 59 verses. You take away the first verse, introducing 59 verse defense there in um, Acts chapter 7. Well, Paul has just a part of a verse, one sentence almost here. That's as far as he gets. That's all that he needs. And he can smile under his... He knew what was going to happen. That's, I think, why a lot of the commentators... You know, it's just too bad that the only people that, you know, we can ever read after are all the unbelievers. Yeah. Because people like us, we don't write those books. We, we live them. <laughs> we, don't, we don't sit around wasting material, write, wasting time writing material. We go out and live it. We teach it and believe it and rejoice in it and live it. Amen. But I think that's probably why the commentators have such a problem with this passage here. They don't know if Paul's lying or not. It's one of those alleged examples of an apostle or a saint of God telling a lie. Paul says he's a Pharisee, and he's not. He's a Christian. He's anti-Pharisee. Well, no, in one regard, he's a Pharisee. The Pharisees stand for a lot of good things. Paul hasn't repudiated those good things. He stands for the same things. But what would happen in, and I think the denoms think of this, what would happen if you ever got someone really filled with the spirit of wisdom in a good old denominational board meeting, but maybe an Acts 23 repeat, when you can get the, the deacons and the elders fighting, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees fighting, and Paul doesn't have to preach, and I think some denoms just don't like Paul's smirky attitude about the whole thing here. You know what I mean? It, that Paul can make this statement. He knows where it's leading. He knows what the outcome will be. And after he says it, he just smiles. <laughs> and it kind of turns and laughs behind his hand. The denoms don't like that smirky attitude. Well, that's not being a good Christian or not being humble or something. But we said before, they're the ones who have the problems. They've got a lot of mixed up ideas about what a Christian fruit and what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is all about. So when he had so said, there arose a dissension, and this didn't catch Paul by surprise either, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. Mm -hmm. Divide and conquer policy, divide and conquer. For the Sa and see, Luke has to tell, you know, Theophilus and other readers of this book, for our benefit, he has to tell us some of the things of the background of the Sadducees and Pharisees. I mean, if we didn't know this either from... Acts or earlier from the Gospels or if we didn't have either from extra canonical sources, we wouldn't know what to make. Well, why was there a division? 
So what there was it? Why was there a division? What caused it? Well, Luke has to add in a few verses here, especially verse 8. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection. Paul said, I'm called in hope and resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees say there is no, re that's what we're on now, their denial of the resurrection. Neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both, that is, the resurrection and the spirit world. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part, See how some of our earlier teachings come into play again here. The Pharisees had their leaders, the legal experts and interpreters of the law, the pace setters, as, as it were, known as the scribes. So the scribes, along with their disciples, the Pharisees, are probably willing to admit that any man who believes publicly in the resurrection isn't so bad after all. I mean, what you really have here is Paul's using this to get the Pharisees against the Sadducees and vice versa. The, the Pharisees themselves were against Paul to, be, to begin with because of the Acts 21 episode. But I think that uh, they're willing to forego their hatred and wrath toward the Apostle Paul because they found a greater source of hatred and wrath, and that is these religious denominational opponents of theirs, the Sadducees. So the Pharisees are probably willing to say that anyone who is bold enough to publicly side in with the doctrine of the resurrection couldn't be such a bad fellow after all. So they arise and say in the middle of verse 9, we find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken by him, let us not fight against God. Then verse 10, when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, some of them wanting to save him, some of them wanting to kill him, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the, literally, the fortress. They didn't have castles like they do in Scotland. <laughs> Castle is kind of a mis, um, misleading term. Castle's okay as long as you know it's not the castle of the Scottish Moors or something. It's a fortress. Now, I just want to show you one other thing before we go on. If you turn back to chapter 21, back to 21, verses 28 and following, and I'm going to read this in light of what we just read in Acts 23:10, 10, the last verse. The chief captain fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down to take him by force from among them and bring him into the fortress. All right, back in chapter 21, the Jews cry out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. He had a great reputation in his day, didn't he, for stirring up trouble. And further, brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain, Claudius Lysias, Luke names him later on in this book, of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them, and when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing, some another, among the multitude. Uh, that is, among the Jews. Sounds like a typical business meeting. And when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the fortress. You see how each episode, the conclusion of it reads very similar? Well, this, this is just my suggestion here that Luke, remember he's the inspired writer of the book of Acts, and he's no um, lightweight when it comes to literary matters or when it comes to spiritual matters or when it comes just to natural mental matters. Luke may be saying something behind all these successful rescues here, and it may be something like this. The irony of it all is that the Romans, it, this could be said in one sense anyway, the Romans are more appreciative of the Apostle Paul 
than are the Jewish people. They accept him better than the Jews do because they're all the ones go always the ones going about trying to rescue him and save him. So that may be some more intended irony on behalf of the gospel writers. The whole New Testament is the good news, the gospel, remember. And some irony on behalf of the Holy Spirit as well. Because I just can't help but notice that both of the accounts in their conclusion read very similar. It's always the Romans who come and rescue Paul. The Romans come and rescue Paul. The Jews want to kill him. So remember what Luke is writing about. Acts, the spread of Christianity. What he may intend for us to gather from this is that the Gentile people receive the word of God and God's true messengers better than the Jewish people do. Of course, the Romans aren't receiving him there, and I wouldn't intend for you to gather this, neither would Luke. Receiving him unto salvation or receiving his message, but just the fact, just the physical fact of their rescuing him on two occasions here, uh, almost, it, to me anyway, shows that Luke means for us to understand that the Gentiles are more receptive and appreciative of the message of God and his messengers than are the Jews or the religious people. All right, then let's go. We got to cover some other things tonight. We can't stay forever. Though. Let's go over to the passage in the Synoptic Gospels that will give us our second text concerning the Sadducees and their denial of the resurrection. It's found in all three Synoptics. I think Matthew 22 is the better known of them. Matthew 22, verses 23 through 33. For the continuation of this message, please turn the tape over. It's found in all three synoptics. I think Matthew 22 is the better known of them. Matthew 22, verses 23 through 33. But Matthew 22 is the barest of the three, so I don't think we're going to turn to that right away. Mark 12, 18 to 27. Mark 12, 18 to 27 is more complete than Matthew. And then Luke 20 says things that the other two don't even come anywhere near saying. Luke 20, verses 27 through 38. So I think what we don't want to do is, is read, uh, at least in the first place, the Mark account along with Matthew's, and then we'll go over to Luke. So in other words, you need to keep your finger in Matthew 22 and over in Mark chapter 12. Mark 12, beginning with verse 18. And by the way, all of them begin with verse 18. It's different verses, like in Matthew 22, it'd be 23, in Luke 20, it'd be 27. They all begin with the same verse, which says this, the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. Mark, the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. Luke, the Sadducees, which deny he uses a stronger term, which deny that there is a resurrection. All right, so all of these little pericopes in each of the synoptic gospels begins with this same um, preface. You have to have this to understand the story. The Sadducees deny the resurrection. Okay, with that in mind, then Mark 12, 18. Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they ask him, saying, Teacher... Moses wrote unto us, I think Luke and Mark speak of the writing of Moses, and Matthew doesn't record the writing aspect. If a man's brother, now you've got a picture who we're talking about, the Sadducees, and they're trying to trip Jesus up, of course, and listen to this story. If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now, that is found back in Deuteronomy chapter 25, and it's called after the Latin name, the law of leveret marriage. We generally call it that in theology, but that really owes itself to the Latin language. It's called other things, but it's best known as the law of leveret marriage. That if a man marries a woman and he dies before he's able to have any children by her, having children was very important in Israel. Having descendants who could carry on your name was very, very important. The property that had been given to you that was a part of a certain family, whether of Reuben or Gad or Issachar or Zebulun or Judah or whatever, it'd be lost. 
If you don't have someone to take over your name, to take over your land and your possessions, it'd be lost. Some other tribe would assume it or it'd get married out or whatever. You're going to lose your land. So it's very important to marry, to have children, and of course, uh, in the first place, to have a son, a daughter. That wouldn't help terribly, although Moses did set into law certain things concerning men who had only daughters and who had no sons. But it's very important to have a son. But if you didn't have a son and you died, and you had a brother, then it wasn't unusual or unnatural, it was part of the Mosaic law. Then your brother was to marry your widow, you're dead now, marry your widow and raise up seed and the firstborn son would then have the rights and possession of his now dead father. And then other children would belong to, well, his brother here. They would be counted as his father, his uncle, in a literal sense, but it was as though it were his father. Now, there were several, seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. The second took her. So there were a couple of brothers here and died, neither left he any seed. And the third, so there are three brothers, and the third likewise. And the seven had her. There are seven brothers. And left no seed, and last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. Well, now, if you were a Jew who believed Old Testament teaching in that regard, the law of levirate marriage, Deuteronomy 25, and you believe the Old Testament's teaching on resurrection, what would you say? What would your response be? They think they have him between a rock and a hard place. You're going to have to deny something. And they've got him on the law. Moses wrote unto us. They've got him on the law. So he's not going to deny that. What else is there to deny? But, yeah, you guessed it, the resurrection. They're forcing him into a corner to deny the resurrection. So he says in verse 24, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of God? If you hold your finger there now and flip over to Matthew 22 and verse 29, the only reason I'm going over here right now is to give you another one of those, what I said were probably hundreds of examples from our Sunday morning studies in the Synoptic Gospels concerning the Ipsissima Verba and the Ipsissima Vox. Mark has that cast as an interrogation. Matthew has it cast as a statement. Ye do err. He didn't say, do ye err. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Well, which was it? Was it interrogation or a statement? You could assume both, but that's rather redundant and extreme. Um, he could have said neither. He could have said one, and one of the others is expanding or interpreting that. So course we're not going to get it. I'm just showing you there's another example. There's just hundreds of these in the Gospels where you might not have in one Gospel the actual verbatim words that Jesus gave. He either cast it as a question or he gave it as a statement, one or the other. Well, back to Mark 12. Of course, you also should perhaps remember, if you don't, I'll remind you from our studies in biblical literature, looking at some of the translations like, uh, I think it was Wiest expanded translation of the New Testament and others, that the Greek has a way of setting a question in, in, in such a way as it expects the negative answer. It expects a negative answer. So, in other words, watch what 24. 24 then would be something like this. Ye know not, ye err, because ye know not the... Well, let me start over. Ye know...